Greetings and welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. My name is Dakota and today I'm talking with Jeff Hayes, founder of Sound Booth Theater. I know Jeff best from his narration of Dungeon Crawler Carl and No One Does a Better Princess Donut. You might know him from books such as Life Reset and Everybody Loves Large Chess or, oh, I don't know, about a hundred other books. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you. <laughs> I feel like I've been listening to your books for a long time, so. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you have. That's it. Could be why you feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been I've been at this for uh, nine nine years, eight eight or nine years now. Let's see, 2013. So nine. Oh. Nine years. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty solid then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you get started? I got started uh, just trying to figure out how to continue to live without having a real job honestly um back in 2012 2013 i i'd say you know it actually took about a couple years for for me to actually find voice acting while i was on my search for uh any anything any kind of creative job on online you know um my uh my folks owned this um business doing real estate you know they they rented out a bunch of apartments and stuff and i was like a glorified maintenance guy for them um and i was actually training to take over their business but they decided they wanted to sell everything instead and split up so um that completely uh completely you know that no longer have a job right laid off um and i i had uh you know not much not much else to do you know i could go find like i'm not a college graduate or anything i i, uh, I dropped out because i was i felt like i was earning better grades than i deserved um, i was going to a the umkc conservatory um learning learning music composition and i loved that part but i had to do all the other extra music stuff like um playing in an orchestra right and i'm like a rock guy i play bass guitar and I started on upright bass and I totally sucked at it and I didn't want to put the work in and I just, um, you know, I just, I, 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 I don't know, I couldn't do it. I, I'm not a good school guy. You know, I just, I want to do things. I don't want to, you know, like study. I don't want to like do work for people, like do homework for people. And I, I don't know, I, I wanted to get paid. I wanted to like get out there and do some cool stuff. Um, that was me being an impatient kid, you know, and that's that's the way it works. And I left the conservatory, the conservatory to just start my own band, start making my own music and just go out there and gig. And of course, that only leads to um, spending money, not really <laughs> earning money. Um, but it also led to me getting a lot of experience with sound and recording and um, composing, of course, I, that's something that I wish that I had more time to do nowadays. Composition is still my passion as far as uh, music goes, and I'll be doing more of that, but I'm getting there. You know, I'm, I'm building things up so where, to where I can just do that if I want to, and, uh, may, and the business will keep going, you know. Um, but that's, that's what I had my training in, music and and I say training in air quotes because it's really just listening, right? Um, I didn't pay enough attention in school to 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 get what I should have gotten out of it. And um, anyway, I had the gear. I eventually found voice acting. I eventually found Voices.com, started doing little commercials and stuff. I was probably, I was auditioning about a hundred times a week. And I was making, I was landing one maybe two auditions per week. So that's a lot of work for no pay. Um, but I kept, I just kept at it. Um, and, and in those auditions, it, it's also worth noting that I didn't actually care what the audition was or who it was for, or I was like, I'm going to just try it. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't, I don't care if this is not my strength. I don't know what my strength is. I'm not like a, for real official voice actor yet i was trying to find my way and i figured the best way to find my way is to do everything and that's where i got my discipline i suppose or lack thereof which is you know me pushing to flex my instrument to do anything i possibly could 
Now, of course, I only landed stuff really that was within this voice, right? Around this, you know, my natural voice. I would only really land jobs that way until I found audiobooks, until I found an audiobook job that I landed. And um, I actually did that job for some company. I'm, n- I'm now uh, blanking on the name of the company, but they were a company that did curriculums for schools. And one of a part of their curriculum was this novel called Freak the Mighty. And um, man, they paid a lot of money for me to do that. It was my first audiobook. Um, and ba- at the time, I was in a closet with with a with a you know like a regular clothes rack going all the way across. Still there. I needed it because I put hangers up and then I hung a duvet off of those so that it would be in the form of a very very narrow tent. And uh, I would you know do voices in there for 20 minutes at a time before you know falling out and nearly dying of uh you know heat exhaustion um but i made it through you know i made it through the whole book it was maybe only four hours but i was so proud of it when i was done because i had to narrate as someone that doesn't sound anything like me and then i had so many different colorful colorful characters uh to play as well and not only that but like you know it's as if you're a director at the same time when it comes to audiobooks right you you want to set the pace. You want to set the tone. You want to send. You want to set up your listener to be there in the story, um, and that's what I did. And they were very happy with what I did, and 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 it was great. But then I started getting other jobs, more sci-fi stuff, and none of them paid it quite as well as that company. Um, but then I found ACX, and I found out I could get royalties. I was like, uh oh. Okay. Um, that means no ceiling, right? No ceiling to my pay. It's all about did I, it, it was exactly what I wanted, which was a direct linear relationship between how happy my listeners are and how much money I get paid. And that's, that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted accountability. You know, I wanted to fail just as, just as easily as I would succeed if I did a shit job, you know? So, um, that's, that's how I like my world to be is like i like to get paid according to how how little i'm messing up or how much i'm messing up right like um and i i want to know how happy people are by watching those reviews so my goal was i want reviewer to i want listeners to to say who the hell is this guy that is doing these voices what else can i pick up by him so of course when i'm doing these royalty jobs at first make no money no money at all like none um maybe three or four sales in like a few months for my first book you know but i expected that you know i was getting the chops like i was i was just learning you know i'm i'm learning i'm getting things done i'm learning how to produce i'm learning how to act and all that um and eventually i started doing these things called stipends through acx which they like this this was a long time ago they stopped doing this pretty i i I think I was doing it for less than a year by the time they stopped doing stipends. But it used to be ACX would actually pay you $100 per finished hour on top of your royalty share if their algorithm gnomes decided that it was a profitable audiobook. Um, And their their gnomes were very often wrong, but it didn't matter because I was getting that $100 per finished hour. That that meant I could keep building up my royalty share library to the point where I'm just reaching as many people as possible. I'm 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 just I'm going out there. I'm going to as many genres as I possibly can go to. And again, I'm using the same philosophy as I had d- during Voices.com, which was I don't care if I'm right for this job or not. Technically, I'm going to make myself right for this job by flexing my instrument to the to the to the most I can. Um, and that's that's the story. You know, um, Sound Booth Theater were, was about me um, being lonely. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, I, I had no, um, I had no thought that Sound Booth Theater would become something that was a business that would actually be profitable for me necessarily. I was just thinking, man, it'd be cool to like 
play with people, <laughs> you know, um, to have other people on my projects just to just to have someone to talk to about what I'm doing and just to just to feel some kind of camaraderie with people. And, and it just it just kind of snowballed. That's <laughs> that's really what happened is I, I just kept going uh, and, and I started, you know, it's not like I make a decision thinking that it's going to be profitable. Like I have no thought to that. I always, it's always, oh, you know, it'd be cool. Um, but then after we do the thing that I think is going to be cool, then my brain starts going, hold on a sec. Maybe if you make this tweak or that little tweak, you can start getting some profitability. Right. And so I started thinking, oh, wait, you know, me teaming up with other narrators, that's that's sort of a way to make my name spread a bit further, isn't it? Right? Like other people are narrating things. I'm, I have to do, just do a little bit of voices for, for their narrations. And then my name's getting out there along with not, not, and not only that, but my name is helping this other person, you know, get, get, get some more recognition. And so that's all it really was from the beginning. And now it's turned into this monster. Well, it's a wonderful monster, though, because like, um, I guess when I first started listening to audiobooks, I didn't want anything extra. Um, like, I did, I just wanted somebody to read me a story so that I could drive back and forth to wherever I needed to be and be entertained. Um, but then I found like Nick Podell and you and uh, Luke Daniels, and I was like, oh wow, okay, so. It's actually so much more than that. It's like a performance. Like it didn't even occur to me that it was acting um, when I first started listening to audiobooks. Yeah, and I had the opposite. I had the opposite reaction. Um, <laughs> like when I started listening to fiction audiobooks, and this is this is before I even thought of audiobooks as a as like this was when I had a job and you know I was painting white walls white every day. <laughs> And the only thing that kept me sane was listening to the Joe Rogan experience or some other podcast or listening to audiobooks. And the only audiobooks I could stand to listen to were nonfiction because nonfiction, they, they can just go on and on. And I have like a way uh, there's context for me when it comes to fiction. It's the real world. I'm fascinated by this subject. I want to learn more about it. That's easy for me to listen to almost any narrator in nonfiction. But with fiction, you, what you're listening to is bullshit. <laughs> that is the definition, man. It's like they made some shit up and you're supposed to listen to it as if it's not. No, man, you got to trick me. You got to entertain me. You got to rope me in. You got to make me believe that these characters actually exist or I don't care what they have to say. Yeah, so I think that's why, like, I love Sound Booth's production so much is because you add so much more than just narration, even. Like, um, with Dungeon Crawl of Carl, it started with just small sounds, uh, the voice modulation of the AI, things like that. It seemed pretty, pretty low key, but that kind of builds up this whole atmosphere, you know? Yeah, atmosphere is definitely important. Uh, I mean... What's really weird is that lit RPG, man, how do you how do you make that atmosphere? Like, you know, it's it's such a meta, 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 meta genre that you really have to take it piece by piece. You really have to take it scene by scene because it's all over the place, man. Um, and Dungeon Crawler Carl, no kidding, that the tone for that one is everywhere. Yet Matt Dinneman, I, I I don't know. Every time I talk about Carl, Carl, I have to just like heap praise upon praise on Matt Dinneman for making a piece of fiction. I've never worked on a piece of fiction that was so solid from front to back, like no loss of, of quality consistency whatsoever. He, it feels like he has an amazing plan and he's got this underlying tone of both hilarity, right? But 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 th that it wouldn't be so funny if it wasn't so dark and deep, yeah. right? It you it's only that funny because you care so much about their their situation and because you actually do feel like you're there. If it, it if not, it'd just be a bunch of jokes, you know, yeah. you know. But but really, there's this horror underlying everything that makes it to where your body, I guess, wants to laugh. It needs something to make it laugh so that you don't cry. 
um and he does such an amazing job of keeping that balance and and it i you know the best authors to me i don't have to work right i just it it just bleeds off the page and i know it, it i just absorb it and it's just it's just right there and it's easy um i know exactly what to do i don't have to think i just i just react um the less skilled an, uh, an author is the more i have to like think about it and figure it out okay what do i want the listener to feel right now what does the author want from me you know or not not from me what does the author want from their listeners um so the, it's it's harder to, to figure out and you have to kind of like manufacture it you have to manufacture the tone if you don't know what it's supposed to be yeah i think um one of the best things about uh matt Dineman is he's just so his tone is just so on point for where it needs to be. And then with your narration, it just makes it so, it like elevates everything to like a, a even more heightened sense of, oh my God, this is horrible to, <laughs> to donut saying something stupid, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, as funny as Donut is, um, yeah. as funny as Carl is, those moments, of fear, of terror, of of loss. Um, that you know, Donut is such an incredibly well developed character. Um, my favorite scene in all of Dungeon Crawler Carl is Book Two. Um, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't listened to it. I mean, if you haven't listened to it already, if you haven't at least read it, you guys. I don't know if you really are lit RPG fans, to be honest. You're not paying attention to the best thing that's happened to the genre. I've, I, like, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not shilling. Like, this is, I'm so passionate about this series. But, spoiler alert for any of you who are way behind, book two, there's a moment right after, um, right after Carl puts the doomsday scenario into the box right and they're sitting in the room and they had just talked they 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 were they, they just watched the i can't remember what his name is i think he was the mayor's husband um kind of like wilt away he's just kind of like in a corner like all ashen and just like you know shriveled up and they just witnessed him have this breakdown and and donut says carl i don't want to be an npc ha <laughs> That made oh, that made me curl up and just want to hug the cat and just like, oh my god, I I was crying. I was crying at the end. I've cried four or five times during this series. It, it's so deep. It's it hurts so bad, and the the characters are just so real. And that's that's why that's why it hurts so bad because you feel like this is happening to your friends. I know. And then I was talking to Matt Dineman last week, and he was like, oh yeah, I might just kill everybody. You know. <laughs> I was like, no, don't say those things. <laughs> I mean, but it's built in, right? It's built I, into the concept. You kind, the, I mean, you kind of have to. You kind of have to kill everybody, don't you? I don't know, man. That may be what he does. That I'm guessing it's going to He, he may not be joking. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah, so all of that kind of just builds up into, like, this wonderful, like, audiobook, and then you... You put this cherry on top that's fantastic. Um, how do you go about um, like setting up or getting ready to record for something like Dungeon Crawler Carl? Do you read the whole book and then mark out what you need or? I read every, every one of the books, books one through four before I recorded them. Um, and you know honestly that's like that's like with this series my my favorite part of the process um book five i wasn't able to do that i i cold read that one because i have lumped an infinite amount of work onto myself over the past six months and i'm uh i'm just drowning i'm just and and and, and you know it's it's not as if it's all audiobooks right i'm i'm running this platform i'm running i'm running the sound booth theater platform i just signed a contract on friday to get another app created like a, like to replace the one that's there because the one that's there isn't good enough and oh man that it's dude it's really hard to sign away that much money at once it really is 
uh, but but it's it's gonna happen. You know, um, what what we're doing with the with the platform is trying as hard as we can to make it something separate from Audible that people don't even really think about Audible when they go to it. Um, we're using it as our playground to show what we like to do, which is not just voices. You know, we don't like audiobooks is just the tip of the iceberg for us. I'm a musician. Um, I'm a sound engineer. I'm I love sound effects. I and I'm loving becoming more and more in ingrained into the medium that is audio drama and not only not just so we can make cool audio dramas but because i want this company to be um as versatile as possible and this, it, it's my own philosophy from the very beginning is i want to be as versatile as possible so that whatever jobs pop up i can be the guy and sound booth theater i want sound booth theater to whatever audio job could possibly pop up from video games to animation to movies to art installations to whatever i want sound booth theater to be able to handle the job and that's what this platform is about is like creating a playground for us to show people what we can do and eventually yeah i want to monetize it i mean it's been very expensive to make so uh, the more people can get on there and buy stuff the better but that's a huge chunk of my time huge and it's and it's a bunch and it's it's really just it's it's not fun to say it but it at right now it looks like a bunch of work and money that's going down a drain because i have to be patient and i have to let people find it and i have to i have to get out there and advertise and i have to put the right content on there and make sure i'm attracting as many people as possible it is a long hard road and it may not be a road to success you know, but you know what? That's how everything I've ever done has started off is like, ah, oh, this is like this mountain that I have to climb. And who knows if it's even worth it to get to the top, but nothing else to nothing else to be done, man. Nothing else to be done. I got to try. I got the I got the bug. I got the I got the curiosity. Um, I have the ambition. Let's let's give it a shot. So that's huge as far as time is concerned if i wasn't doing that stuff i'd be narrow you know i'd have all the time in the world to pre-read all my audiobooks i'm trying to get back to that spot i'm trying to delegate and delegate and delegate and pick up more and more people for my company so that you know it's not being run by a mad scientist like me <laughs> number one so that you know maybe we have a better chance in business right and number two so that i can get back to my strengths which is you know which is just stopping and engaging the text and synthesizing as much as I possibly can in the first read uh, so that I, I'm prepared when I get in the booth. Um, when I get in the booth now, it's like, uh, here it goes. What's, what's going to happen today? Um, and it, hey, I like the fact that I'm a really good cold reader and I get to show off in that way. But at the end of the day, I prefer that the product be better. And that's what pre-reading does. So and you know, long long answer short, I wish that I was pre-reading right now, but I'm not. Those cold reads are really great too, though, because it seems like um like the bloopers reels almost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's entertaining to watch your process and watch how you do it, and you've actually um you make these available, right? Like these are you video record them and you put them on YouTube and yes, so um. They're on YouTube. Uh, anything that hasn't been published to Audible yet. We have an exclusivity contract with Audible, and I'm not sure if that's going to mess with things or not. So I, we just to be safe, we take everything down from YouTube and we take everything off the platform before we publish uh, on Audible. And the obviously the Audible version is the cl the clean, finished, edited version with all the bells and whistles, whereas uh, the cold reads on YouTube um, get the, hey, get it when you can, because it's not going to be there for long, right? But that is warts and all, you know, like all, like all my mess ups, everything that I do wrong, you get to see it. Um, and to me that, you know, that's, I like to watch, like lately I've been, I've been just for an example, lately I've been, I've been reading a lot of comic books, right? And I'm very, very fascinated with, with the drawing process. I've always loved watching people draw, right? And I love watching what they do when they mess up and try and figure out how to deal with it you know they're working with they're often you know sometimes they're working with with ink right they can't 
they, oops, no, no, that, that has to be part of the, the picture now, right? That's cool to watch, you know? I, like, I, I've always been fascinated with process, like any kind of production process. And, and so I figure, hey, there must be people out there who, who like that as well, who would look at it from an audiobook, you know, watching audiobooks. And for sure, we're getting lots of views on YouTube for, from the cold reads, especially, of course, Dungeon Crawler Carl. And especially, especially that one because I don't sound anything like Carl. Um, because, you know, pretty much the entire thing is not me, even though it's me. Um, so, you know, people, when they see it, they're like, what? Um, <laughs> most people who, who see me, they're like, wait, you did Donut too? You know, <laughs> like, they don't realize that it's just me for, for this series. Um, and I've been getting that most of my career anyway but uh, but this is you know youtube cold reads on on our platform by the way go to our platform you can download that that stuff for free um but you have to get it now or it's going to be gone when it's published to audible um people like that people they get they're just so fascinated by the process and hey cool i love it it is like being it is like watching art be made like like i could sit and watch people make like random things on YouTube all day. So why not something like this too? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the series that Sound Booth Theater is starting? Because you have like um, the Kaiju Battlefield series. Oh, okay. And um, there was a couple other ones too, right? Okay, so yeah, uh, you're, you're talking about the, the, the full cast sound effects and music serials. Yeah. Um, we're calling those deep dives, um, okay. because the name audio drama is not sexy. Um, and we kind of wanted to br brand it towards lit RPG, right? Like the deep dive as in, you know, getting in your VR headset, doing a deep dive. Um, it's funny, it, it, it comes like, I say deep dive a lot in the, in Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon. And so it just, it feels thematic and it's, and it's neat, you know? problem is most people don't know what the fuck i'm talking about if i say oh we're making a deep dive right so it's if i'm i've given us another uphill battle congratulations um and uh yeah so those let's see you're right we have kaiju battlefield surgeon that is matt deniman's horror novel that he published i believe in 2019 possibly late 2018 um the audiobook actually came out uh produced by tantor narrated by joe hempel and he did a good job, you know, but at the same time, man, I wanted this stuff to pop. I wanted this stuff to come to life. And I wanted something on the platform that would carry Matt's name, you know, and carry his brilliance over. Because I, guys, this guy, I don't understand how he's so good. But Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon is really a, a, a piece of, a, a masterpiece. The only piece of lit RPG horror I've ever seen Honestly, I don't know if anyone else is even trying to do horror in this genre. Um, and you would think because of the meta nature of lit RPG and how, you know, everyone's a video game character and your death doesn't really mean anything, that having no stakes would make horror impossible. But nope, Matt figured it out. Um, so really, it was all about just, okay, what do I hear in my head? What am I, how am I feeling during these things? And translating it not just into my voice, but into sound effects, into music, and directing the people that I've been working with for the past four years now doing sound effects and music. And I have such an amazing team now that Kaiju has turned into this, like, I, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with, with, with this series because it's so big and awful and daunting and... And, and and the suffering that the main character feels is so poignant. Being able to bring that into audio is is um, just been a thrill. And Matt has been great through the whole process. Um, and yeah, I, I I can't wait for more people to listen to it. It's completely free. Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon is 100% free if you go to our app and you download it. There's four episodes already. That's almost 10 hours of content. We have five, six more episodes to go. And they're coming out monthly. Um, all of our serials are coming out monthly. Uh, Harlan has finished his arcs with us with Malevolent. That's a that's a horror series that's completely produced and performed by Harlan Guthrie, who is another talented bastard. I mean, he's really great. And he's going to be doing more sound effects stuff for us as well. 
um, in in future projects. Um, but that's 20 whole episodes, all free. Go pick them up. Uh, we have Stars Have Eyes by Naven Ilyev, the author of Everybody Loves Large Chests. And it is a complete 180 from Everybody Loves Large Chests. It is a heartfelt, beautiful, romantic comedy. And even though the main character is still like, you know, some kind of sociopathic monster, instead of the sociopathic monster going on about its business and being a sociopathic monster and killing as many things as possible, she's trying to learn to become human. And she's loving it. And she's loving this idiot who has become her partner. And it is one of the most beautiful, like, touching stories I've ever read. And I would never in a million years think that Neven fucking Ilyev would read something like, would, would write something like that. Um, but it just shows his tremendous range. And I wish, I wish more of his fans would, would, would check it out, honestly, because, I mean, maybe a lot of his fans are just his fans because they're, you know, they like the sociopathic craziness. Okay. <laughs> Great. I, I, I get it. Hey, I, I love that too. I again, I was not expecting what I got from Stars Have Eyes, and I just knew this is something that's 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 beautiful and wonderful. That I know that Annie could could knock out of the park as far as that character, um, and Ahmed has done an amazing job with the music, and like Harlan is actually doing most of the sound effects for that one. Um, so that's got eleven episodes. We got four more to go. Those are all monthly as well, and then the last. Uh, deep dive serial that is ongoing at the moment is earth force 2 um which wasn't planned as a serial at first um it, when we first launched the platform in october october 31st of 2020 we launched it with book one of earth force and that was fully done the audiobook and the deep dive were completely finished and that was exhausting to do. Oh my God, that was a huge, huge product pro project. And it, it was only, you know, after we'd released that and after we'd launched the, the platform, we were like, what the hell do we do now? Like people aren't signing up because we screwed up the app before it came out. And, you know, it was this absolute chaos when it came out. It was, it was a disaster, right? <laughs> but, but we, we figured it out, you know, we figured out, okay, what can we do? How, how can we keep these going? How can we continue to actually increase the quality of our productions while still putting stuff out? You know, we can't just sit on a project for a whole year and hope that people will stick with us and hope that people will remember it. So we decided, you know what, we're not going to kill ourselves here. We're going to do monthly serial. And so that, that's, that's what we have for Earth Force 2. We have the full audiobook classic audiobook no sound effects or music no no full cast whatever it's just me you can buy that now 10 bucks easy right off the bat right but with the serial we're releasing every episode for four bucks and we're gonna have six episodes total the first episode is free so you can sample the product um the first the whole first book still just eight bucks and that's with the full sound effects and music so like it's a really good deal right now um but yeah, we're trying to figure out how we fit. And again, comic books, man. That's what I've been studying a lot, right? Like that whole that whole go every month a, a new issue comes out and it's, it's it's just a taste, right? It's just a taste, but the art is exquisite. It's produced beautifully. And that's that's my goal right now. That's the difference between me and audiobooks right now is that's that's what I'm trying to do is like reach more into that part of these of people who aren't engaged by just a voice or who are engaged by just a voice, but welcome the embrace of the rest of the immersive experience and who can be as passionate about um, the the atmosphere and, and everything that the sound effects and music can bring to make the experience that much deeper. I'm excited to start those now. Uh, <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> yes, please do, please do. <laughs> um, so how do you decide what the cutoff point is for like an episode or like your monthly release? Oh man, we're just shooting <laughs> in the dark. We're just trying to figure it out, man. Uh, this, you know, this is all, this is all, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's plenty of you out there who've listened to my stuff. Like everybody loves large chests and life reset and dungeon Lord where we, we've been gradually adding more and more sound effects and music. And that's all just been learning. 
you know, figuring out how to do these things effectively. Of course, it's super easy to just take some sound effects and throw them on there. You know, it's it's digital. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, and it's also the easiest thing in the world to do to get somebody to take their damn headphones out and say, screw this. I don't want to listen to this nonsense. Right. Um, so we're figuring it out. We're figuring out how much work it takes to get this much audio done. Um, it's looking like what we want to do, what we, what we want to be doing eventually is 30 minutes to an hour at most per episode. And right now what we have going is at least an hour and a half. Um, like episode two of Kaiju is like three hours and something. Um, I have been, I have been slave driving my engineers. Um, I, I have to say, and it's not, it's not intentional. It's just, you know, that's how I treat myself too. So, um, you know, sorry guys, sort of not sorry. It's, it's been really fun, but you know, uh, that's, that's what's happening right now, but eventually we'll figure out what our, what, what is actually manageable. And I think, I think an hour per month for whatever the serial is, is acceptable. Now, remember I'm running three yeah. different serials at once and they're all monthly. Yeah. And I have audiobooks to narrate. Yeah. And I'm getting into comic book production. And I'm like <laughs> trying to run a whole platform and like ah! I and do you have myself. family and you have other obligations. Th I'm thankfully, sure. actually, thankfully I am single, so I'm oh, not okay. torturing anybody any uh, on, on a personal level. It's just yeah. I'm o I'm only wasting my own life. <laughs> so, um there's that. That's, you know, eventually, hope you know, someday maybe I will have a family. And so, like, all the money part, that should be taken care of at that point, hopefully. Um, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll be able to say, okay, I, you know, I have, I have Justin Thomas James, who is now the, who is now the uh, president of Sound Blue Theater Audible, right? Oh, so okay. he is, he is the main boss of the things that actually make us good money, Right. He's the one making sure things go to Audible. Um, he's and I'm the one trying to sink his ship on on uh, experimentation, trying to reach further, you know. Um, so so now, like, I get to be the mad scientist and and not mess things up too bad because we have a really stable guy in Justin Thomas James who, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure many of you have listened to his narrations before. He's one of my favorite narrators. So. Um, yeah, that we have that going eventually, hopefully someone will be running my platform in, instead of me, you know, and, <laughs> and, and I can just focus on doing things like this, you know, talking to people like you, going out to comic cons, hanging out with Matt Dinneman, getting wasted, um, and, and coming up with new ideas to frustrate the rest of my company with, you know? So is, um, I forgot his name already. The one who handles the audible portion justin. Is, yeah justin yep. um is he the one who helps decide um or helps the new narrators find like the next project or their first yep. project even okay yeah he's yeah. the guy he's he's uh if if you want to impress somebody um you know like if you can get my attention okay th that might work because I'll, I'll tell justin but you better dude you better be really good or else i'm not i'm sorry i'm my mind's moving a mile a minute justin is much easier to convince so go talk to him <laughs> justin Fair. thomas james everybody <laughs> justin thomas james yes. okay um so with these serials how close do you have to work with the authors or are you pretty set because the books are already out my authors really trust me um okay. shemmer uh like for for earth force um i discovered just saturday that he hasn't even been listening to the serials because he's like dude i don't i don't want to wait i just look you once you're finished i want to listen he listened to the first episode and he loved it so much he's like i can't i have to put it away for a while and uh i i only just showed him like okay so it's not just taking a novel and reading that and hoping sound effects come out like we edit the script we take out a bunch of narration he says she says he nodded yeah. stuff like that we're taking all that stuff out so that it can be performed you know mm -hmm. and so that you get it from the performance you get it from context you get it from sound effects um instead of it being told to you in exposition in excruciating detail right um that's a lot of work to get those scripts done and he didn't even know i was doing that 
He's like, oh, man, can you show me those scripts? He's like, dude, you've done a lot of stuff. I just showed him today. Um, so Shemmer is, the, you know, he's the he I probably work with him the lead. You know, he, he gives me just you just do what you need to do. Matt, um, Matt actually did the first script for the the first script for Kaiju. Um, he, he took it. He edited this the shit out of it. And he's like, dude, I can't do this. <laughs> This takes up way too much time. I was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, so I just took the script and took a black line through a bunch of stuff. And eventually I, I got to a point where I, you know, I'm not sleeping or anything. I got, I had to hire somebody <laughs> to take my, my scratch, take my horrible doctor's handwriting all over these PDF scripts and turn it into scripts that people can actually read. Um, so, so Matt, trust me though. Um, he's not, as far as I can tell, he's not been upset with any of the decisions I've made with with the the deep dive of Kaiju, um, and Naven, uh, Naven is just he he works really closely with his cover artist. Uh, if any of if any of you know uh, Naven Ilyev very well, you know that if you go to his Discord server amongst the the uh, trouble you can get into in there with some some of the naughtier bits, um, you'll also see there's a ton. A ton of art that his friend um, D Max Custom has made for him for Everybody Loves Large Chess. There's just like you could almost make a comic book out of it, you know. Uh, hopefully that'll that'll be happening soon. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get that to happen. He, there's actually an Everybody Loves Large Chess comic out there. I don't know if you guys knew this, but it's it's like a manga. It's just black and white, and it's me. You know, it's yeah. it, it was it was somebody's attempt, and it didn't it didn't it, no one was really impressed. Um, so I, I want to get his original artist and be like, yo, I'll pay you. Come on, come do this thing, you know. Um, but, you know, that's that's coming along. Anyway, Naven, he works closely with his artist. So he's been making all the covers for The Stars Have Eyes. And sometimes, sometimes he's not happy with a voice or a voice here or a voice there or an actor that I choose for this this role or that role. But he tells me, you know, and I, and I care. And, you know, I always want to make sure, I mean, the production schedule is so overwhelming that it's often hard for me to make sure, you know, it's often hard for me to to share with them first because then I got to get approval and then we got we got to wait for this to happen and, and we can't wait because we got to publish, you know. Um, but o overall, I think I think he's been happy with it. Uh, I, I like I like to work closely with with authors, you know. I'm I'm always like when I was doing all of Dungeon Crawler Carl Five. I always had Matt's chat in Facebook open, <laughs> especially okay. since it was cold read, right? I, who the hell is this character? Uh, did we run into this person already? Oh, shit. You said this was this was a female. Come on. <laughs> I did a female voice for a character through the first, through books three and four, and then I find out they're male in book five. And uh, so I had to, like, I, I almost, like, I didn't even change the voice. What I did was I just started with the female voice and I slowly sharpened all the consonants to the point where, okay, maybe maybe you'll fall for it. It's actually a dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Hand wavy. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty magical, though. Like, that something like that could still happen after being five books in, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, he is weaving a complex web that that author man matt Dinneman. uh there's a lot of characters there's a lot of universe yes. for him to explore um uh, i i don't really i don't know where he's going with it and man i just can't wait to find out honestly it's i'm so stoked for dungeon crawler carl six already even though i just finished recording book five just mon uh just tuesday last tuesday that's when oh, i finished wow. so it's just going through proofing and polishing now um, hopefully, hopefully it's out in a month. Okay. That's exciting. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Um, during the audible issue, did you get sent pictures of feet as well? Or was it just audible? Oh, that was, that was my idea. Oh, <laughs> that was my idea. I sent the first <laughs> pic feet pictures. No, no, I didn't. I didn't send the first feet pictures, but I did get stir the crowd into a frenzy. Um, that was my... That was my doing because we were so frustrated. Okay, so what happened was, for, for, for those of you who have listened to Dungeon Crawler Carl, I'm sure you've noticed our uh, 
end credit stuff, our fun commercials at the ends. Um, and for Dungeon Crawler Carl 4, um, we did it again. And uh, yeah, I loved the skit. But for some reason, uh, ACX flagged it. And I didn't notice. I didn't notice that they'd flagged it because I had no reason to think there was anything wrong with the file. But they're like, oh, for some reason, your end credits are really, really long. It's like, oh, hi, person who doesn't know me, even though I've made, you know, six million dollars for your company. Um, yeah, uh, we did that on purpose. And that's all I had to say. But it was delayed for a whole month because of that. Yeah. And so after after I re resubmitted it, uh, it was still taking a long time. So we were just getting frustrated. And I was like, what can we do? I don't know. Let's keep the hype up somehow. I didn't expect it to work, but it kind of did work because as, as soon as like the very next day it was out. So I don't know, man. ACX, watch out for the feet. They're coming. <laughs> They're pissed. They will come if you do not release the projects. <laughs> Indeed. I've set that the was precedent. pretty good, though. Yeah. Like... Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Feet pictures. <laughs> Some of them are gross, not going to lie. But, you know, you do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, I'm not I'm not a feet person, but you know, I respect the AI's fetish, okay? I respect it. <laughs> um what's the weirdest thing you've narrated? Ooh. Still got to be uh still got to be Astro Kid um The Adventures of Astro Astro Kid and Space Dog Leroy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, it was a kids it's a kids book. Some some guy wrote a kids book. It's absolutely incoherent. It's it I I don't know I don't know how one conceives of something as, such as this. Um, I don't know how one gets the motivation to actually put it out into the world, but he did, and I gave it my all. Um, I, I so my favorite thing about that book is uh i sent i you know what i used to always do with narrate with authors before you know i was known um was i would do three different narration styles and i would send them to the author um and say which one do you want and um by the time i was done reading half the book i was like what do i i don't even know what to do with this nonsense and so i did two voices that were kind of normal and then i did the dudley do right narrator voice i don't know if you guys have ever watched that show but it's just like this and you get really excited and you go really high up into the register and you very loudly proclaim everything that's the one he wanted i did that voice and that's the one he wanted and god damn it that's what i gave him and so the entire thing, it's now it's only two hours and something long, but I just was like, you know what, I'm going to just go nuts with this thing. And I did all like ridiculous character voices for everyone. And I hope someone gets a hold of it one day and makes some some like s just terrible animations <laughs> and puts them on YouTube. It, like there's lots of material there for anybody out there who's who's uh, looking for some stupid project to do while you're tripping on acid or something. Um <laughs> Go go find the the adventures of Astro Kid and Space Dog Leroy on Audible. Okay, all right, that does sound pretty strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what would you like? What kind of advice would you give to people wanting to start breaking into narrating? Oh, um, my advice is to remain playful. Um, I think that, I think that there's too much, uh, out there, uh, uh, too many people out there concerned with making this into a career, into making this into a job. And that's not how you should th be thinking about it. Um, in my opinion, because if that's how you think about it, then that's how you're going to make your decisions. And it's going to become a job. It's going to just, I mean, it's going to be a thing. It's going to become a thing 
why don't you just go do accounting? Why don't you just become a lawyer? I mean, those are, I think that's kind of like the intelligence level of people who typically want to do narration, right? Um, except they're actually responsible jobs. <laughs> you know, this is like, dude, we're goofing around here. We're doing, we're doing voices. We're bringing to life the crazy dreams of people who are kind of nuts and who just sit there and type away at their computers all day okay um don't get me wrong those are the i'm one of those nuts right i'm i'm a crazy person um and i have a lot of fun doing this but if you're if if the joy isn't what you're after i don't know that this is the right thing for you to be doing um if you're not playing in the booth if you're not having fun and if you're not really like uh if you're taking yourself too seriously and you're thinking about it as a career, you're not going to get the best performance out of yourself and you're just going to be another narrator, you know? Um, I, like I said before, every decision I've made this whole time besides, well, shit, what do I do for money without getting a real job was, hey, this is going to be fun. Hey, this is, this seems like a good idea. This, this seems like, like, I'm lonely. Let's do this. You know, it's all been not about the career but about the craft that's why i think sound booth is gonna be very successful uh because you enjoy it and people can tell that you love it right like uh. i think so i i think people i i think if they weren't picking up on that yeah. um, i wouldn't be sticking out yeah so I don't know. You just have an energy, like a happy energy, even during those dark, dark moments with Carl. <laughs> um, hmm. Seems very nice. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I like it. Well, thank you. I, I, <laughs> I try and make people comfortable. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> incredibly, incredibly important when Matt Dineman's trying to make them as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you got to get the shock, right? If right. you're not comfortable in the first place, then when something uncomfortable happens, then, then you're going to be like, yeah, whatever. It's another thing. It's another, you just, come on, keep throwing those hot dogs at my, fi my face. I don't care. Uh, but, <laughs> but if you're, if you're comfortable, you're unassuming, you're not expecting it. And then all of a sudden a llama spits fire in your face, it's going to have a lot more impact you know it's going to be a, 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 it's it's going to you're going to remember that a little bit better yeah i think you're right yeah <laughs> um since you just finished dungeon crawler carl what are you working on right now chrysalis chrysalis by rhino z um first of all uh I, we're doing a lot of business with a publishing company called athon athon books um they're really they're pretty damn successful indie company and that's that's the kind of people we want to work with indies you know i i want to stay indie um man trad better bring me a big fat paycheck if they want me to work with them you know because uh, i don't i don't see why you know like it i i can't take per finished hour work because it's like oh okay i'm gonna narrate this book and take the money you paid me to turn around and pay one of my narrators Right. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. I have no reason to, to try that. I only want to get involved if if I have skin in the game. So um, so Athon, though, they're cool with that. You know, there's uh, there's other indie pub publishers who don't get it. You know, they don't understand why that why you share royalties with another company. I, I mean, I don't. I mean, they, they, they will publish with the bigger companies that give them a smaller percentage than I would, but for whatever reason, they don't see, they don't, these other publishing companies don't see the value. Well, okay, Athon does, Athon does because Athon likes audio, right? They love audio, they are fans of me, and they know that we're a value add, and that not only are, we, are they going to sell more out the gate, in units with our brand attached but they're also going to their, their tail is going to be much bigger yeah. right like they're they're when when sales lower we're going to maintain a higher sale average month to month 
because people are looking for our names. People are looking for Sound Booth Theater. They want to listen to the next Sound Booth Theater audiobook if they finish one. They're, uh, if they're on Audible, the chances are they're either looking for a particular author or they're looking for more and more people are looking for narrators. They're searching the narrators instead of the authors because they know that they're at least, even if the writing sucks, they're at least going to get a good show. Um, so th that's what I'm banking on. And that's, I I'm doing my best to spread my philosophy throughout my company and make sure that the people that we pick up share that philosophy, you know, that, that, um, this isn't just, this isn't just a product to pump out there and, and make money off of. It's not just an IP is not just some commodity. Um, an IP is something that an author poured their heart and soul into sometimes. <laughs> A lot of the time the the ones that we want to work with um and uh that it's something to be treated with the utmost care and respect and that it's something to make something beautiful out of and not just some commodity to exploit and so if any if there's any producers out there any authors out there who want that kind of philosophy behind their audiobook production we're the I don't know who else you go to besides us, if that's what your attitude is. So, um, you know, Athon has that same attitude. They want they want to treat their authors well, and they want to give their authors products the best chance of retaining um, saleability and retaining re-listenability. You know, that's 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 important to them. So. We're partnered up with them, and we're 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 doing a lot of stuff with them. Chrysalis is one of those. Chrysalis is on Royal Road, um, which is where every single one of our very successful authors comes from. Um, and Chrysalis has, I think, already six books of material, like two million words or something, already on Royal Road, and they're just now starting to publish his stuff. Um, in June, June seventh is the pre-order date for Chrysalis, the first volume. And so that's what I'm working on. And um, I'm it, what it is, it's a, it's a little RPG. What if you became an ant? <laughs> okay, yeah, I could get into that. It's great. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, I get to I get to use my Joe voice and I get to, you know, narrate with this with this sort of, you know, uh, very bright, like, um, you know, a nice guy. Cockney sort of, but like just a little gentler than Cockney, you know, it's more of an estuary, but he's young, he's enthusiastic, and uh, he's quite liking the idea of becoming an ant, to be honest. So, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I haven't narrated with that voice before, and I always want those opportunities, you know, new characters. Give me somebody completely new to be for a while, and that's that's where Carl come from, came from, you know. If, if, this guy, this guy that you're talking to right now, this voice, this is not Carl. You would never believe that this was Carl. If Carl, even if I was saying the things that Carl says, you'd be like, yeah, but that dude's like kind of like a younger, like maybe skinny guy, you know, like you, you don't, you're not exactly sure, but he, I sound kind of younger, you know, but Carl's like this big, burly, almost biker type guy. Yeah. Um, and first, you know, first things came to mind, Patrick Warburton, of course, one of my fucking, one of my all-time favorite voice actors uh yeah i knew that was the guy to cast like i knew i couldn't get a hold of patrick warburton to get this thing done by him so i had to do it myself perfect that's perfect and i love your philosophy too because um the only reason i went to atheon um books is because you were attached to one of the projects so um like I went there and I purchased a couple of books and I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, like I've never heard of them before. So. Yeah, yeah they're awesome. They're great guys. They understand. They understand uh, how the market works. Yeah. Um, they're they're helping us straighten our house up too. You know, like we're we're taking as m we're learning as much as from them as we possibly can, and we have a lot of respect for each other. So, I think this is going to be a good relationship going forward. And we have a lot of stuff coming, not just Chrysalis, but a lot of stuff that's narrated by our other narrators that's that's coming from them soon so so are you kind of breaking out of just um lit rpg then oh man okay lit rpg is what got me to the dance right yeah. like the first other life dreams um was my first giant royalty share success mm -hmm. 
Um, and that was that was I think my last uh, my last uh, stipend as well. Um, but when I got that, man, I knew I was home because like I felt like, oh, man, everybody else who's auditioning for this. These are all old, old people, <laughs> old fogies, you know, like who won't understand all this video game shit. I know exactly what's going on here. And then I got a harem to deal with. So I got all these female characters and I can do all their voices. No problem. You know, I can make the you know, I can like th I was I was home. You know, I was like, this is this is where I'm going to stick around. Uh, and, and so back then, man, I don't even know if the lit RPG society had a thousand members back then. Um, but I was like, you know what, I'm going to pull up, you know, I'm going to put my stakes down here. I'm going to, I'm going to set up shop and I got as many lit RPG books as I could back then. Um, and it's been great. I love lit RPG because it's unpredictable and well, in a lot of ways, right? As far as genre, as far as setting, as far as you know, the things that might happen. It's a funny genre. In fact, you're almost, you're pretty much going to fail if your book's not funny in this genre. Um, you, you, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I honestly can't think of any lit RPGs that I read that weren't funny that I enjoyed, except maybe Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon. But that one still got really great funny moments, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's always something I, I want to, be handling his humor comedy uh that's that's t to me that's like if you were to if you were to analogize it with music with, with genres and music comedy is to fiction what jazz is to music right it's it's it requires improvisation um it requires being you know being up on your toes it, it requires the most impeccable timing um and it requires that you are kind of versed in all the genres so that you know how to be funny within the genre you're in so um to me because it's such a challenge and because i just enjoy laughing so much uh comedies comedy something that i always turn to and lit rpg is always going to have that for me however i love like all genres you know uh, I, I, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to do some more historical fiction sometime. I'd love to do some like deep drama or some just like regular deep romance, you know, like something, something like, you know, for me, Stars Have Eyes scratches that itch, because, but it's too funny. It's too funny to really be what, what I'm looking for, for pure romance. You know, like I want, I want to, and not because I particularly like romance, but because it's a challenge. It's a cool challenge, and I and I want to affect people that way. I want to figure out how to push every little button I can inside of a person. Um, uh, and so exploring genres is something that I naturally want to be doing. Um, and that's, you know, that's both the things that have, that, that that's something that's made my strength in this career, and it's also the one thing that's caused me to make the most mistakes in my career is because I'm just always looking for something new. I'm always looking for a new way to affect people. Um, my last question actually comes from Matt Dineman, and it's uh, what kind of shoes you got on? Because uh, apparently he's so impressed with your shoes. I have no shoes on at the moment. <sighs> Tragedy. Yeah, um, I I think I think that was a trick question. He wanted to he wanted to know if I was barefoot. I think he wants to see your feet, right? I do love shoes. He he, that is that is true. I'm a I'm a shoe guy. Yeah, he says you always have fancy fancy shoes. Yeah, I I, I like my nice shoes. I do. That's fair. Everybody's got their thing, right? Yep, indeed. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jeff, for joining me today. <laughs> thank you, Dakota, for having me. Um, I said it last week, and I'll say it again. Listen to Jeff narrate Dungeon Crawler Carl. You'll laugh. You'll be grossed out. You'll possibly discover a new fetish. Um, and as always, thanks for listening, and have a great day. Thank you all. <laughs>